Hi, everybody. Thank you again for joining the latest Apiculture Online, the Hive Chat with NC State. Um, we have a great lineup uh, again this evening. Um, really appreciate everybody joining us there on YouTube. Don't forget to um, subscribe to our channel. That really helps us out a lot. It also give you the opportunity to, to get an uh, instant notification that we're live streaming when we have any new postings of, of new videos or anything else. Uh, also, go ahead and leave comments and um, likes, thumbs up, all that, that you want. Um, and then if you have any questions as we go through uh, the next hour or so, uh, please go ahead and, and type them into the, to the comment or chat function there. Uh, clearly, won't be able to get to all of the questions, but uh, we have monitors who are going to be going through and, and picking out um, some of the, the questions that are of general interest for everybody um, so that we can repeat those and, and continue that discussion. Um, I'm going to really hand over the, the reins here for the most part for everybody. Um, and I'm going to turn over our first section, our first um, uh, uh, segment of the Apiculture Online, which is bees in season, which is in essence what the bees are doing right now and what you as a beekeeper should, should really be doing uh, about them. I'm going to hand it over to our Apiculture technician, Jennifer Keller, and she's going to go ahead and talk about some of the things that she's been seeing in our research apiaries at NC State. All right, great, thank you. Get in my screen up there now. It is. Go ahead and hit the the uh, um, the presentation view. There you go. There it goes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for uh, letting me talk about my bees today. This is an honor. I want to talk about what's going on out in your bee yard right now. And we've this, we're going to be repeating some of the things that we've been talking about, but it's still true. And we keep saying that the nectar flow is just about over. And I'm putting a question mark here because um, just today, as I was shaking frames to get the bees off, uh, a lot of nectar came out. And it was very surprising because I wasn't expecting any flow to be on, but there was a lot of uh, nectar on the ground. So I'm not sure where it came from, but I'm not going to complain about it. But really and truly, um, for all intents and purposes, the nectar flow is over, which means the next thing on the list is to watch out for robbing. Robbing that we did also see that today, uh, the, nectar that was shook on the ground. It did not take but just a few minutes before there were a number of bees there uh, to clean it up. And it, they, they did a really good job cleaning it, but, but we don't want to get robbing started. So it's something to be on the lookout for. And I just want to say that it's easier to prevent robbing than it is to fix the problem after it gets started. So what you want to watch out for is leaving hives open too long, which will attract other bees. You don't want to leave it open any longer than necessary. Go in there, do what you need to do and get out. And then also, if you have any bird comb that you scrape off or if you're feeding, just try to keep it in the hive. Don't throw a bird comb on the ground. If you spill, try to clean it up and don't leave anything sitting around for the bees to come and uh, steal. Because once they get started, it's really hard to stop them. Um, if the colonies are light, because the nectar flow is, is no longer on, you may need to do some feeding. It's hard to describe how much to feed, but you don't want to continuously feed your bees. You just want to make sure that they have some food in there. I've heard of people just, you know, as soon as the feeder is empty, they add more. Don't want to do this because you'll not leave room for the queen to lay and they'll get crowded with nothing but nectar in their colonies. So uh, feeding is very important, but don't overfeed. Next thing on my list to look out for and what we should be doing out in the bee yard right now is that uh, I have just recently gone into a few colonies where a couple of weeks ago they were doing great. I thought they were you know, just boomers and just went in recently. Now they're not doing so good and population wasn't great. Pulled up a few frames and I'm like, hmm, not sure there's a queen in here. So I know that these are hives that probably swarmed or you know, superseded their queen and the 
the queen was not successfully replaced. And so now my colony, these colonies that in that case are going downhill. So if you don't do anything about this now, you know, you'll end up with laying workers, wax worms, or small high beetle larvae, all of which are pretty bad and uh, hard to overcome. So it's easier, once again, to go ahead and take care of these situations now. And then what do we do about it? Uh, if you find a hive that is indeed queenless, go ahead and try to combine it with another colony. Or um, if it has a good population of bees, you could potentially find, buy a queen, purchase a queen, put it, put it in there, and maybe it can make it. But if it's at all weak, it's probably better to just go ahead and combine it with another one at this point. It, uh, our, our goal now is to get it to the winter, and if you start with a small population right now, it's probably not going to have enough time. So, all right. Next on my list is something we all love to hear about, are mites. And uh, we, mite levels are definitely on the rise, which we predicted because we knew winter was short and spring was very long, which goes hand in hand with mite levels going up. And so mite levels do seem to be high this year. And if you haven't already done so, now is the time to determine levels in your hive using either the sugar shake method or the alcohol wash, whichever you prefer. They are both good if done properly, but you have to make sure you're doing it properly. And if you don't know, please ask a, uh, another beekeeper or your inspectors would love to come help you out, I'm sure. So what we kind of go with is a threshold of about nine mites per 300 bees. And easiest way to sample that is to shake, shake a frame of capped or be, being capped brood, get the bees into a tub and scoop up a half a cup. It's about 300 bees. And so then you are going to count the mites on there. And if you come up with more than nine, that's above threshold. In this yard here, uh, this, just this week, I've started really seeing numbers uh, in the teens. The highest one I got was 29. So my, my numbers are definitely up there, and it's, it's time to think about what to do. Um, if your levels are high enough where you need to be treated right now, unfortunately, the apivar is probably the only miticide that can be used in these high temperatures. You aren't, if your levels aren't at that point yet and you can wait a little bit longer to where the temperatures cool down some, then there's, there's more miticides that are uh, able to be chosen from. But you don't want to wait too long. If, if your numbers are up, you don't want to wait till you can use another one. You want to go ahead and knock them down now. You might have to treat again later. Uh, if you want to use the oxalic acid in the winter, that'd be a great time to use oxalic when there's no brood. But like right now, oxalic won't work. So you might have to do something to tide yourself over until you get to that point. But it, whatever you choose, just you know, know what your mite levels are. All right, so now that's what's going on right now. And then looking ahead to the next month or so, it's kind of more of the same, unfortunately. Your feeding is still important. If your hives are light, you're gonna to have to feed them. You need to boost them up the, the stores for the winter. And don't overfeed so the queen doesn't have a place to lay. And robbing screens are an option, which I'm not sure I mentioned earlier. But if, you, if robbing is going to be a problem, go ahead and put them on and it will help the robbing if you only have one or two hives, it's probably not a big deal. But if you have more than a handful, then the, the stronger hives will try to rob from the weaker hives. Um, it's late enough now that bees should be done swarming, although I'm not sure about out in the mountains. I think they might still be going. But for everybody else, go ahead and check to make sure your hives are queen right with good laying queens and that we, we want these to go ahead and make it through the winter. So we want nice, young, good laying queens. And they, you know, whatever you think will make it to next year when you can start getting more queens again. 
uh, like I said, monitor for varroa mites. That's something we're going to be doing from now until winter. If you just want to make sure you know what your levels are, because they're only going to go up from here. Uh, this is the point where the, the curves kind of stays flat and gently goes up, and now we're, we're on the big uphill. It's important to have healthy bees to make it through the winter. So if you start out with mite-ridden bees in September, then there's no way they're going to make it through till March, where we start getting the nice new bees again. So we want to make sure to start the winter with healthy bees. And then have a plan for when that mite number exceeds the threshold. If, it, if you're still good, that's great. Hopefully, hopefully they'll stay low. But if they do go up, what is your plan? And you know, go ahead and think about that now and have an have a idea of what you might want to do to get your numbers back down under control. All right. So Jen, there's actually a, a question here for you before we transition to the next segment here um, about uh, apigard for mites and that um, low dose thymol is listed for high temperatures, which is the problem that you alluded to, but the limited number of, of uh, options that beekeepers have in, in high temperatures. Uh, apigard is, is pretty high level thymol, isn't that correct? Apigard, uh, yes, and I'm trying to remember what the temperature levels are. I can never remember all of them. I, I have to read the labels, so I always tell everybody read the labels before you use it, because I can't remember them all. There is a temperature threshold, um, if anybody out there wants to answer that, but just make sure you're under that. Uh, perhaps one of the apiary inspectors on, on the, uh, from the NCDA might have that off the top of their heads. Um, but my understanding was that uh, the, the, the high level thymol can also burn brood and, and cause other problems in high, high heat. Yeah. I don't think any of them are, are chiming in on, on that, so that's fine. Well, I got a note here from Lewis that said 20% thymol should be good to 105 degrees. So Okay, so, so I, I was wrong on that. So I, uh, I thought that that was higher thymol content than that. Okay. So yeah, so that's another option to ape a var is the ape a guard, I guess, this time of year. Okay. Cool. I'll read the label and verify that. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thank you, Jennifer, as always. It's uh, very, very insightful. Um, we're going to now move next to um, who actually is an alumnus in our, uh, from our program, an alumnus as of, as of yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, Dr. Joe Malone. Joe Malone was a PhD student here at NC State until uh, very, very recently. Um, he came in with, his, uh, with a real strong idea of what he wanted to do in apiculture research, which was toxicology and, and the effects of pesticides. It is not a mainstay of what we do in our program. And so warning him that uh, anything that he would need to do would be very independent and he would need to get advice from, from others in the college about toxicology and boy, did he ever do that. He was very independent, very, very strong student, did some really, really excellent work. Um, and he actually ended up finishing a whole semester early because um, the very first job interview that he got was for his dream job with the EPA up in Washington, DC, and he was offered that position. And so he's actually already up there in the, in the Beltway area and is going to be starting next week with his new position. But he's very kindly agreed to talk about some of the research that he's wrapped up here at NC State on uh, pesticides and honeybees. And so I'll just turn it over to Joe. And uh, say, you guys can hear me? Thank you. There you are. Yep. Great. Let's share that screen. Can you guys see my screen? Perfect. So thank you very much for that kind introduction, Dave. My name is Joe Malone, and as Dave mentioned, I'm a recent graduate of the apiculture program under Dave Tarpey's leadership. And uh, you may have guessed it by now, but the topic that I'm going to be discussing today is co the conflict of pesticides and honeybees. And before I really get into the meat of this, 
I just wanted to quickly say that while a lot of this information might not seem super actionable for being a better manager of your bees, I still think as beekeepers and more generally stewards of pollinators, this is an important issue to understand because it is so highly publicized and frankly contentious. So to get into it, I'm gonna start with a, a background of the issue of pesticides in honeybees generally, and then I'm going to shift gears into discussing a project I did during my PhD, which was comparing differences in larval pesticide tolerance across different honeybee breeding stocks. And to start with that 30,000 foot view, in the United States, many food production systems rely on inputs to overcome the challenges of growing crops at very high densities. And these inputs include things like fertilizers, insecticides, and herbicides, but maybe a lesser obvious input is that of pollination. If you look at this image here on the top right, this is actually an aerial photograph of the almond bloom in the Central Valley of California, and it's an ocean of flowers there. The, the density of plantings of these trees is, is really impressive, and each of these individual flowers requires pollination in order to produce the almond that is valuable. And the way that this can happen at these densities is through the importation of honeybee colonies onto these landscapes to ensure adequate pollination. And when we look at pollination services in the United States, we see that the vast majority of this work is being done by managed honeybees. And this is to a large part because they exhibit many favorable characteristics for this service, such as floral constancy, living at high densities of insects per nest, and also the ability for them to be moved around colonies, um, moved around the country, excuse me. But at its core here, we have the conflict between two of these inputs in use in agriculture, where you have the chemicals that are being applied on fields that are used to control pests, but also the insects that are being used to ensure pollination can also be indirectly affected by these compounds. And when we look at the chemicals frequently detected within commercial colonies in use for pollination, uh, we do see that those chemicals applied in the ambient surrounding landscape around the colony are detected within the nest. Here is data from a pesticide residue survey of commercial colonies uh, showing frequency of detection of different pesticides in wax and in bee bread stored in processed pollen. And in addition to those uh, pesticides in use by growers, another dominant component of this internal chemical exposure environment within colonies are the varroicides, those chemicals that Jen mentioned earlier, they're in use to overcome the challenges of varroa, and these are applied directly uh, within colonies, and so they're a key part of this. But another important component of this story is that multi-pesticide exposure, the co-exposure to multiple compounds simultaneously, is pretty much ubiquitous within these commercial colonies. And this study here found that there was an average of 10 different chemicals detected within each wax sample, and an average of seven residues within bee bread. And this presents a challenge to toxicologists because each individual compound is going to interact differently with the organism. And one way to overcome this is to use something called a hazard quotient, which allows for the standardization of each chemical detected within a mix of residues. And the way that this can be done is through accounting for the dose and the toxicity of a specific compound. And I'm not gonna get too far into the weeds here, but the HQ for each individual pesticide within a mixture can be added together to provide a rough additive estimate of the overall pesticide hazard within a mixture. And to distill it even further down, a higher hazard quotient is basically indicating that there's an increased level of pesticide risk within that mixture, whereas a lower HQ has less pesticide risk to honey. And when we're thinking about the issue of pesticides, it's important that we understand their prevalence in the environment and their effects generally over here on this nurture side of the continuum. 
But hammering down deeper into genetics and variation in tolerances is a just as important component of this story because it takes susceptibility to an exposure to create conflict and risk. And this goes for other environmental stressors as well. And when it comes for comparing background genetic differences, in, in the US, there are lots of comparisons to be made. As many of us know, honeybees are an introduced species to the Americas that have arisen from various importation of these old world progenitor honeybee subspecies. So honeybees in the US are, are mixtures of these old world genotypes and to a large extent, mutts, a mix of these. But another dimension of honeybee diversity in the US is variability in human management that these populations are undergoing. On the far left here of this continuum are those populations that are actively selected in systematic breeding programs for traits that we deem valuable, most notably varroa tolerance. There are also bees that exist within the context of, of honeybee, of uh, beekeeping operations where uh, there could be passive selection going on in the background where some bees are maybe more conducive for that management environment. And then on the far side of this continuum over here, there are those bees that are completely feral and removed from human involvement entirely. These are the bees living out in the woods, inside of trees, completely removed. So many different comparisons to be made here when looking at tolerances and stressor susceptibility. And here are the stocks that I looked at in this study. I included three systematic breeding lines, two of them being USDA programs and one from Canada and Saskatchewan. We had two breeding stocks that were from commercial lines, Italian and Carniolan. We also happened to have some old world Carniolan queens on hand. And these are queens that have arrived in America as a result of recent importations from Eastern Europe. So very distinct old world queens here for this old world Carniolan group. And lastly, I was able to also sample some North Carolina feral bees from out in the Pisgah National Forest, where there's a remote population of unmanaged bees which are putatively feral. And so with these stocks, we have a good cross-section of those different dimensions that I mentioned in the previous slide. And when it came to the test mixture, as I alluded to earlier, my work has been mostly focused on testing mixtures of different compounds that are frequently detected within commercial colonies. So I developed a mixture of seven frequently detected pesticides and what you're seeing here at these four dose levels that I tested is that seven component mixture represented at the same proportion, but with increasing strength as indicated by that increasing HQ level, higher HQ being more toxic, lower HQ being less toxic. I also tested control and solvent control groups as well here. And so when it came to actually executing this experiment, as I mentioned, I was interested in comparing larval pesticide tolerance across these stocks. And the way I actually did this was we established queens of these different stock origins into colonies and basically used those hives as, as grafting sources where I would remove day-old worker larvae, very similar to how you would rear queens. But instead of placing them into queen cups, I introduced these day-old worker larvae into a, an in vitro rearing system where I could be a nurse bee and rear them in the lab on diets containing one of these different trees. And I reared these larvae for the duration of that larval stage and recorded mortality daily for this part of the experiment. And this was done in order to determine uh, the dose response relationship of these uh, breeding stocks to that pesticide mixture. So here we have some data. So based on that dose response testing that I did in year one, uh, we did see differences in the pesticide tolerances across stocks. So this figure here on the left is showing the dose response relationship of these different stocks. Each of these curves is a different color and represents a different breeding stock. On the X here, we have log dose, and on the Y, we have a mortality unit. And you can see that as dose increases, so too does that mortality. And if we look at this dashed line here, which indicates that 50% mortality level, and you may have heard of an LD50. This is a median lethal dose as well, very similar. And this is another way to visualize where these curves intersect with that dash 50% mortality. And looking at this, you can pretty clearly see that there were 
uh, significant differences when comparing that larval pesticide tolerance across stocks, where we had the Paul line having the lowest dose achieving that 50% mortality, meaning that it's the most susceptible, whereas on the other end of the spectrum, we had the North Carolina swarm and old world carniolan stocks requiring the highest dose to achieve that 50%. So these were the most tolerant stocks. And in between those two groupings, we saw a gradient of increasing tolerance. And when I overlay that continuum that I presented earlier on this chart, it sort of fits roughly there, where you have the Paul line, this highly bred, systematically bred stock being the most susceptible, whereas that North Carolina swarm, that putatively feral and more distinct old world genotype, background genetic stock, the old world carniolans being the most tolerant. And this was a very interesting finding that we wanted to follow up on. And we wanted to do this by exploring the mechanism that could be potentially driving this difference. So if you take this concept diagram with a grain of salt here, it is sort of oversimplifying things a little bit, but I'm trying to just explain enzymatic detoxification here, where the organism ingests a pesticide chemical and uh, the organism has these detoxification enzymes which sequester these chemicals and alter them chemically, making them more readily solubilized and excreted by the organism. And for this component of the research where we're looking at that biochemical mechanism, we decided to focus on this class of detoxification enzymes called esterases. And these are something that honeybees have and humans has, have them as well. They're very well studied and important for, for detoxification. So we wanted to focus in on that as a potential mechanism. And so this work was done in collaboration with Dr. Frank Rinkovich, who you will be hearing from very shortly. And we tested all of the same stocks in a similar fashion to year one, with the addition of one more Italian commercial stock from California. And to carry out this comparison, we repeated the in vitro rearing in a very similar fashion where we grafted day old worker larvae. Instead of testing different doses, we simplified it down to just a control with solvent and a single treatment dose level of that same pesticide mixture. And we did an esterase activity assay. So in simple terms, we were just comparing the activity of this detoxification protein in these larvae to try to understand the observation that we had in the year prior. And we did this through a substrate inhibition assay. So we compared activity towards different substrates, uh, which are known to activate esterases within various organisms. And here's some of the data. On the left here, we have control larvae. So this is showing differences in that esterase activity towards one of our substrates uh, across stocks in those larvae that did not receive the pesticide treatment. And we could already see differences in that enzyme activity across stocks with uh, notably Pauline being towards the lower end. And again, this is from control larvae. But we're also interested in understanding that differential response towards our pesticide treatment, which is an important part of the story for sure. And what we saw here is when comparing relative activity of those larvae that were treated with that pesticide, uh, pesticide mixture relative to controls from those same hives, we saw that Paul line had a significantly reduced relative esterase activity of that detoxification enzyme. So a lower level here means less detoxification activity from that specific en enzyme that we were investigating here. And we saw very similar results with one of the other substrates. They correlated very closely with this uh, relationship across stocks. And to sort of put it all together here with this figure on the right, where we have that HQ50, that median lethal dose, which depicts pesticide tolerance, higher being more tolerant, lower being more susceptible. And we compare that to the uh, enzyme activity of these detoxification esterases to these two substrates, which correlated strongly. We see a loose relationship here between pesticide tolerance and esterase activity, with the VSH stock having the lowest esterase activity and also the lowest pesticide tolerance, with the Italians sort of having very different esterase responses between those California Italians and Georgia Italians, possibly highlighting the heterogeneity of these stocks and their response to the stressor. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have those stocks that were the Old World Carniolan and North Carolina Feral Swarm, that putatively feral stock, 
which had very high esterase activity in year two and high pesticide tolerance in year one here. And to just quickly sum up the, the broader impacts of what all this means, breeding can have unintended consequences. Bottlenecks from human movement and selective pressures where we're selecting for specific traits can certainly have unintended consequences on other important traits and robustness of the honeybees as indicated by the increased susceptibility from BSH larvae. Not all honeybees are the same. So uh, it's very important that we pay attention to stock origin when testing sublethal and lethal endpoints of different pesticides in a regulatory capacity. And lastly, more work should be done to follow up on the detoxification uh, mechanisms that we sort of just scratched the surface of here. There are certainly other detoxification enzymes that are important in honeybees, and uh, they deserve study as well to get to the bottom of the differences that we found in pesticide tolerance of these larvae across different breeding stocks. So I know I threw a whole lot of information at you in a very short time. I hope that you got some little bits and pieces out of it, but uh, if there are any questions specifically pertaining to this uh, portion of the talk with this project, I can answer them now. Uh, if not, we can, we can discuss them during the open Q&A a little bit later too. So Joe, I didn't see any uh, specific ones, although there, there is kind of a, a little bit of a lag uh, between the Zoom session and, and the YouTube, so um, we'll let maybe some of those come in. But cool. what are your... Um, thoughts about the, um, the, the, the fact that it's totally counterintuitive that those that are um, most wild living and not supposedly exposed to pesticides actually have a higher ability to detoxify, right, rather than a, a lesser one. Um, you know, what do you think accounts for that? Yeah, so I, again, going back to the unintended consequences of selection, I mean, when we manage bees, uh, we're, we can have indirect effects on just for, say, selecting for the queens that we like that maybe have offspring that are less aggressive. And there can, there can be unintended consequences of even more passive selection. But certainly when there is a systematic breeding program where, we're, where you're selecting for a highly specif specific trait, that can definitely have other consequences as well that you're not measuring. So, so are you saying that the, the feral bees, for example, are kind of normal, and then we've been selecting for bees just inadvertently that are worse at detoxifying? Or are the bees that we manage and that we use normally are normal, but then something is allowing for those feral bees to be super detoxifiers? Which, which of those would you think is more likely? Yeah, so I would say that, uh, in my opinion, I would think that we are losing a level of robustness when we are selecting for specific traits in the, the bees that we decide to use as apiculturists and as beekeepers. And it is sort of counterintuitive where you would think that the bees that are in use in these industrialized commercial beekeeping operations would have higher levels of exposure, and, and it would be intuitive that they would have a higher level of tolerance. But uh, interestingly, we didn't see that, and honeybees are sort of a unique case when it comes to uh, pesticide tolerance. I can go off on a tangent there, but uh, you have reproductives that remain within the nest and foragers that are out really experiencing the brunt of these chemical exposures in the environment. So it's, it's sort of a different system there for that. Well, I can assure everybody who, who's listening to this um, that this is only the tip of the iceberg of everything that Joe was able to accomplish during his short time here. Um, just so be, be on the lookout for, for many different papers authored by Joe and, and different collaborations that he's done. Um, very impressive work and, and uh, we're sorely gonna miss him. Very, very, Thanks, very, very much. Um, I'd like to then go ahead and, and introduce our, our uh, guest to interview, which Joe alluded to earlier, Dr. Frank Rinkovich from uh, the USDA at the Baton Rouge Lab um, down in uh, Louisiana. And we're really lucky to have him, but couldn't think of anybody better to continue this discussion about ecotoxicology and, 
and the potential impacts that pesticides have. And as Joe said, that study that he just um, presented, uh, Frank was an integral part in that. And so uh, welcome, Frank, and um, thanks for joining us. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm glad we get to talk about something that's right in my wheelhouse, pesticides and honeybees. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we, I thank you for the invitation. So I'm going to turn it over to Joe, because I know you guys have a lot of questions that, that you'd like to talk about kind of in general. But um, I'm just going to pose kind of a, a very simple one in, in that by studying, you know, pesticides is um, it, it's a real downer to be, you know, dealing with a lot of these issues. And so how do you keep yourself going and motivated to study these things that are just, you know, so problematic for, for bees? Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where I, I hate that we have to we have to deal with this issue, but this is something that the beekeepers are very intimately uh, into. So I talk to them at meetings, they come by the lab, and they always keep bringing back this idea of pesticides effects on honeybees. So I've been fortunate to be able to work on some of these very big longitudinal studies in commercial beekeeping operations. This is bees in migratory beekeeping operations in the field like they are in large commercial scale operations. And so that's kind of one of the big important things is uh, get to those field relevant sort of aspects. So that way beekeepers can, one, come up with ways that they could mitigate the effects of pesticides, two, understand how landscapes are influencing this. So landscapes are very important. There's a lot of really good research coming out about that. And then two, get some real data behind, behind these uh, the potential impacts of pesticides. So there's a lot of different things going out there. And as Joe mentioned, that there's a lot of different pesticides that honeybees are exposed to. And that changes throughout the season. And uh, also, too, depends on where they're at. And even year, year to year is very, very important. So it could be a big exposure one year, but those bees in that same apiary, they might not get a lot of exposure the following year. So it's this really complex dynamic uh, that's going on with pesticide exposure. Um, I think that we really oversimplify pesticide exposures, and it's very discreet. But as Joe said, you know, genetics are important. Some of the research that has come out of Marla Spivak's lab with Matt Smart has showed landscapes are really important. Clint Otto has showed this with his work, uh, publications in PNAS. So it's really important that we understand how all these complex factors interact in order to uh, produce these detrimental impacts on colonies. So yeah, it's one of those important things that we need to understand so that way all the pieces of the puzzle are working together. Yeah, very complex puzzle at that too. Um, Joe, go ahead. Yeah, so thanks again for joining us, Frank. I'm just gonna jump right to it. So yeah, you mentioned that honeybee toxicology is sort of your wheelhouse now. I would certainly yeah. agree with that. But I know uh, from your background that you weren't always focused on honeybees. And that's sort of a unique perspective to have as an insect toxicologist, because as we sort of mentioned earlier, honeybees are sort of a unique case study in, in toxicology. So I wanted to ask you, from the perspective of chemical detoxification, what are some of the characteristics that maybe make honeybees unique relative to other insects? Yeah, so honeybees are uniquely, uh, their genetics make them really interesting to study because they seem to be limited in their detoxification enzyme repertoire. So if you compare the number of detoxification enzymes, uh, this is cytochrome P450s, esterases that you mentioned, and glutathione transferases, those are the three major ones. Um, if we compare them across honeybees, honeybees tend to have fewer, uh, about 46 P450s, 24 esterases, where some other insects like houseflies have 150 P450s and things like that. So they tend to have less. However, honeybees are really interesting. So you would think that, oh, they have less of these detoxification enzymes. They're uniquely sensitive to pesticides. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Um, there was a publication that came out of Jeff Scott's lab, my PhD advisor, that showed that honeybees aren't actually very specifically sensitive to any particular pesticide. They just need to be sensitive to pesticides like every other insect. Um, and I think a lot of that, the disconnect happens because you would think that fewer detoxification enzymes, higher sensitivity. However, it turns out that it, honeybees don't really need a whole bunch. Their enzymes are really good at detoxifying a wide variety of different uh, compounds, whether it's a plant compound or a, an insecticide. They have very broad substrate specificity, so you could stick anything into that enzyme and it chews it up. So they don't need a whole lot. They have very few, but they seem to be adequate. And we're just starting to understand how that actually works. There's been some good work that has been coming out of Germany that looked at very specific cytochrome P450s and is trying to get at the, the enzyme substrate uh, interface 
to find out exactly how well they metabolize certain insecticides. Um, so honeybees don't seem to be um, lacking in terms of activity or sensitivity, just genetically they might have fewer. Um, and we've compared the activity of different uh, detoxification enzymes, whether it's esterases or P450s, and they seem to be on par with pretty much every other insect that we looked at, a couple different beetles, some flies, mosquitoes, et cetera. It seems to be right in the middle, <laughs> so. For sure, and in that same vein, I, I think the evolution of detoxification in pollinators is just a fascinating subject where you have this evolutionary battlefield between plants, which are producing these, these compounds to suppress herbivorous insects, and you have pollinators, which incidentally come into contact with a lot of these same uh, plant pesticides to a certain mm -hmm. extent, and, and they had to evolve to sort of deal with that. So it's interesting. Well, another interesting thing about honeybees too is that they don't necessarily consume their food directly. They kind of process it. So they make honey, all right? And they also, they take pollen and turn it into bee bread or uh, stored pollen. There's a lot of microbial activity that happens. So there could be some processes going on in those different systems of the honey uh, curing and the uh, processing of, po of pollen that might change those different chemical properties. Um, I would definitely love to see more data to come out to validate the hypothesis, but only got so many hours in the day. For sure. Uh, another question that I frequently get when interfacing with beekeepers uh, pertains to the risks from applications for controlling mosquitoes, uh, specifically in suburban environments. And I know that this is something that you have at least one publication exploring. So I would love to understand what are the real risks from mosquito abatement in suburban environments. Yeah, so the materials that are used in mosquito control operations, if we take bees in a lab and put a drop of it right on that honeybee, if you put it out at a high enough concentration, it will kill them. There's no doubt about that. However, how it's used in the field is very, very different. It's delivered through these, uh, what are called ultra low volume uh, applicators. So these are the things on the back of the truck that blow out that little fog. And those little droplets have a little bit different interaction with honeybees. And so what we did to look at this was we took bees and mosquitoes side by side in the field in these cages. And we put them at different distances away from uh, where a truck comes by to spray. So this is a wide open field, no trees or buildings or anything like that. And then we saw, uh, we recorded how many bees and mosquitoes died at each concentration for four different compounds at six different distances. And so what we found was that the things that really matter are the type of material being used for mosquito control. That's critically important. The rate at which it's being used. So low rate versus high rate uh, kind of thing. But then also to distance, the further away seems to be better. So it's kind of a complex interaction of those uh, couple factors. Also wind speed is very important. But what we were finding was that um, there were certain compounds that killed very high level mosquitoes, but very few honeybees. Then there were some where it wasn't so different. Then there were some that just killed everything. And the one thing that we found was uh, there's this material called dibrom, and it's what's being applied from these airplanes. When we did that test, it killed every single honeybee in our test. So we really couldn't see if there was any difference between honeybees and mosquitoes, so it killed all the bees and all the mosquitoes. And that's what's typically associated with a lot of these large bee kills. Um, there was that one article that came out about, was that two years ago, there was a massive bee kill in the Carolinas, and it came down to, it was this material that was being dropped out of an airplane. So again, it's all about the amount, the type, and the distance. So putting those variables kind of gives you a, a real world application. So we followed up that semi-field study with actual honey beekeepers in suburbia. So in Baton Rouge, we have a very large beekeeping community and they were very nice enough to let us monitor the colonies for impacts of pesticides. So we worked very intimately with the East Baton Rouge mosquito abatement uh, group and we got really good information on when uh, areas were treated. And then we looked at mortality and enzymes and everything like that, you name it. And we didn't really see too much of an impact on bees in colonies um, for these, uh, with these miticide, uh, these mosquito sites. But again, what really mattered was if there was right near the road, we saw some small impacts, but 100 meters away, uh, very little. Uh, that was also published, uh, another student published that in data as well. So it's out there. Very useful applied research for sure. Uh, oh, Dave, did you have something? 
No, uh, go ahead and uh, one more question. I'll go ahead and scan through some of uh, the ones that are coming in from the YouTube channel. A lot of interest in this. Sweet. Uh, so uh, another question, Frank, uh, it pertains to Varroa control. Something when I'm giving talks to, to beekeepers, I really want to stress that, you know, Varroa will, it will kill your bees. And some sort of control measure, let it be uh, a chemical treatment or some other integrated pest management strategy using uh, non-chemical control measures, let's say. Uh, but how harmful are the miticides which are labeled for use by beekeepers to the honeybees themselves? Yeah, so I think we just brought that up a little bit earlier is looking at some of the different miticides that can affect brood, especially at high temperatures. And we're under a very high temperature uh, watch here. And so things like uh, oxalic acid or formic acid will wreak havoc on a colony if it's used at too high temperature. Um, so that's one aspect. There are some sublethal effects of some pests of these miticides, um, but they typically happen at very high concentrations. Um, and so there, is, there are some detrimental impacts, so that it can affect some of the uh, queen laying, queen longevity, but it's, it's not really a, a black, uh, very survive and die kind of thing. It's like they produce a little bit less. But at the same time is without that sort of chemical intervention, you will see colonies dying because of Roa. So it's one of those things where you want your colony to perform a little bit less or not at all, so. So that actually, um, Frank, gets to a, a question that um, somebody asked in here about, uh, I think pesticides in general, not miticides like you were just talking about, um, having effects on queen viability and acceptance and maybe even on their pheromone production. So, um, so you think that, that not just the miticides, but others might have an effect as well in that way? Yeah, so Liz Walsh from uh, Texas A&M just published a paper on that earlier this year. I think you've both seen that paper. And so they found out that some miticides change the um, queen retinue uh, pheromones. And so she doesn't bring a, a large retinue and then it can also have some effects on um, sperm vi long-term sperm viability. Um, however, those per experiments were performed at extremely high concentrations. They were, they are field relevant. Uh, if you look at the Mullen 2010 paper, they use the high end of the concentration. So under kind of a worst case scenario, you'll see those kinds of impacts for sure. Um, there are some really interesting things going on with, um, with insecticides that we're, we have to get away from this idea of survive and die. That's classic toxicology. However, I think we need to start looking at these non-lethal endpoints. So things like queen longevity or queen supersedure rate, egg laying rate, there's a whole bunch of things that go into it um, that are really important, that we have to look at these non-lethal endpoints. So that way we can't say, oh, this stuff is fine, but yet colonies you know, are less productive, et cetera, et cetera. Also, too, we need to explore <laughs> about some of the old chemistry as well. So neonicotinoids like uh, clothianidin, they get the lion's share of the attention and interest. However, we have a lot of data from our lab and uh, Kirsten Trainer's published results showing that some of those old, these old materials like Chlorpyrifos, which has been around since the 1960s. Um, chlor um, chlorothalonil, which is this very broad spectrum fungicide. Bifenthrin, a very low cost pyrethrin insecticide. We find those very high frequency and at very high concentrations that are often associated with really high um, levels of colony mortality, but they don't get the attention. So I think we need to focus a little bit more on those other materials as well too. So I think getting a broader picture of non-lethal versus lethal, but also to these different chemistries as well. Well, here, here, here on that. Um, I guess that gets to another question that, that somebody asked uh, that flows from that, which is, what is such a thing as a bee safe pesticide, right? Are, or are there any, um, not to name names necessarily, but how do you um, go about qual qualifying something as bee safe versus not? Because that is used very frequently in the ad campaigns, but how does the beekeeper be able to distinguish that with a little bit of, of knowledge and, and know-how? Yeah, so this is a tricky thing because bee safe is typically what, it, so if we're looking at agrochemicals, um, a lot of times on the labels, it'll say safe to use on bees because it's been determined under laboratory settings or very small field studies that this one product at a very high concentration didn't kill honeybees. However, pesticides aren't always applied that way. Um, we'll tip, if we went out and sampled some pollen from a colony up in the Dakotas, let's say, we'll find 10 to 12 different pesticides in there. They're being applied as tank mixes in conjunction with others. And what happens is when they encounter multiple different pesticides, 
they can have what's called synergistic toxicity, which means that one plus one equals three. So it might increase the sensitivity of certain pesticides. So Reed Johnson has shown this with um, different chemicals that are being used out in California almond orchards uh, that leads to this increase in uh, of, uh, that produce synergistic toxicity. Um, so that's really a tricky thing is be safe. I would say that very few things um, are be safe that don't kill honeybees because um, they typically are not only encountering just that one compound by itself. So also, because what happens is a lot of these materials get stored in the wax and it's a source of constant exposure. So there's a lot of complex variables. So I, the be safe label is kind of a, under those small limited controlled conditions, it's safe, but in the real world, maybe not so much. So to, that, to, to follow on that, there were some other questions in there about a lot of common herbicides, um, mm -hmm. especially Roundup, right? That's been in the news a lot. <laughs> Um, what is what is your take? And Joe, I'll throw this back at you as as well as uh, an EPA uh, rep now. Um, you know what what is the 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 link of of Roundup and and bee health both directly and indirectly? I wish we had more information on Roundup. Um, when we do these pesticide residue tests, it's very tricky to detect glyphosate. Um, talking with the people at the Gastonia lab, they have to run through this specialized machine that can only detect this one compound and it's very expensive. So when we look at the, the records of these big longitudinal wide panel pesticide residue tests, we don't test for glyphosate um, just because it's such a tricky molecule to detect. So we really don't know how glyphosate affects honeybees, at least in the field um, in these longitudinal studies. Um, there are some other herbicides that we are finding are associated with uh, higher colony mortality. So weird things that are very, uh, old materials like acetochlor, metallochlor. These are compounds that we find eh, that are associated with colony mortality. So I think we also, like I said, we have to look at these other materials that are kind of less flashy than glyphosate alone. And to sort of build on that, we have, as Frank mentioned earlier, this sort of legacy in toxicology that's really focused on acute effects on mortality and survival. And that approach really just doesn't work for things like fungicides and herbicides, which simply don't have that acute toxicity towards the organism. But that doesn't mean that it can't have effects. I mean, if you think about within a beehive, you have all sorts of microbial processes happening, which fungicides and herbicides could interact with. I know there's been a, at least one publication looking at potential impacts on the gut microbiome. And these are simply factors that aren't accounted for on that LD50, uh, that LD50 variable, which is so heavily scrutinized. And it, it is for insecticides, but like I said, fungicides and herbicides, it's a little, it's a little bit more complicated than just looking at that. No, those yeah. are all really great points. Sorry, Frank. Um, but another thing too that that I always say to beekeepers is that there's also indirect effects where. Uh, prolific use of Roundup and other herbicides also take away weedy plants that are really good nutritional mm -hmm. pollen and nectar sources for honeybees as well. So, um, and then nutritionally stressed bees can then, mm -hmm. you know, succumb to, uh, to other problems. So it really is kind of that whole uh, system thinking. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's another uh, question here that I'm, I'm definitely going to shoot over to Joe because um, he uh, is, has and is studying this very question, which is, uh, do some pesticides have an impact on the fertility of drone populations? I think you're muted. You're yeah, muted. sorry about that. So yeah, there have been studies that uh, others have published on, and I'm doing some side projects looking at the impacts on drone fertility as well. And to sort of broaden this question to look at queens, because queens are an important part of the equation, but the sperm that a queen stores is only as good as the drones that she mates with. So uh, accounting for those sublethal effects on drones is, is very important, and I would say that a lot more work needs to be done on that. Our, our lab is, we focus on, we do a lot of queen work, excuse me, so we focus on that, but we are broadening our horizons to, to account for that drone component of queen quality as well. So uh, yes, there has been some evidence to show that uh, sperm quality within drones, uh, things like sperm count and sperm viability 
can be affected by exposure to pesticides. Uh, what about atrazine in particular? That was something that had come up and, and is also um, being discussed in, in beekeeping circles as far as the effects on queens directly. Yeah, atrazine is a, uh, a highly water soluble uh, herbicide. So it is detected in uh, landscapes surrounding corn very often. Uh, I would say there really isn't very much data on atrazine and that's something that I certainly would like to, a question I would like to answer, but I, I cannot provide any specific information on that material specifically. Yeah, I can't think of any studies on atrazine and honeybees at all either. So it'd be a great area to research though, because we do that, find atrazine in pollen. That seems a bit, a bit amazing, right? Because there, I mean, how many, you know, Ton, metric tons of atrazine are applied in not just agricultural systems, but um, suburban and urban systems as well, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, it, 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 it just seems so daunting, right, to, to go through all of these different things and all the, all the different compounds that are out there and then all the different variables that affect those. Um, this is why I don't do what you guys do. It takes a much a better researcher and scientist than me. So kudos and thank you for, for doing that because we definitely need that and more of it. Joe, any other last questions for, for Frank? Uh, let me just pull up my question sheet really quickly here. Uh, oh yeah, this is one that I'm sure uh, many beekeepers will be interested to learn more about. So I know that you have been doing a, a pretty intensive study investigating the resistance of Varroa to Amitraz. Uh, Apivar is the common label name for that for beekeepers in, in measuring its efficacy in commercial beekeeping operations. So Frank, I'd like to ask you if you are seeing signs of, of resistance toward miticide, is it still an effective option for beekeepers? Yeah, so we looked at that question quite extensively last year. So we did this very large survey of almost 20 different beekeeping operations all across Louisiana and New York, the Dakotas and every place in between. And we found there were pockets of amitraz resistance that led to control failures by Apivar. So it does happen, but it's kind of rare. So out of those 20 different operations we looked at, we only found two where it was, the efficacy was a little um, suspect. So yes, it can happen, but we don't have this widespread resistance like we do with uh, fluvalinate or kumafos resistance. So those are the active ingredients in apistan and checkmite, respectively. So uh, there's a little bit different dynamic between those different compounds. It has to do with how much they go into the wax. So fluvalinate and kumafos are readily absorbed in the wax, where amitraz is not, and um, it changes their exposure environment and their selective pressures. Um, so there's a little bit that could go on with that, but I, what's interesting is that I, I've been calling this resistance management by accident um, because there's been so many products out there that have had extensive resistance mon uh, management strategies. So like things like BT corn that's grown everywhere. There's been billions of dollars of research put into it and product development and stewardship. You have to get licenses and yet still resistance evolved to that. Um, Amitraz does not have that level of rigor in terms of their um, product stewardship but yet they, we don't see these widespread uh, um, uh, amitraz resistance. So this is kind of interesting. We, we need to get at the factors that are causing it. So it's, it's probably gonna be how it's being used in the operations, how intensely it's being used and how frequently. I'm sure that's gonna be really driving uh, amitraz resistance because we do see difference between operations. But generally based on your findings, no major alarm bells for its efficacy failing. No, there are, I think there are, there probably are some pockets of resistance, but not widespread throughout the whole industry where, okay, we got to come up with something else. No, I, we, we found it, but it's kind of rare. Well, very exciting and, and excellent. And, and thank you again, both Dr. Malone and Rinkovich. Uh, appreciate this discussion. Could have gone on for, for hours and hours on this, mm -hmm. but uh, we're going to try and... Um, uh, wrap it up. I just want to remind everybody that uh, we're doing these Apiculture Online webinars every other week. So the next uh, Hive Chat with NC State is going to be on July 15th, again, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard. Uh, the timely topic next time um, is going to be presented by, by our very own Aaron McDermott and Brad Metz, 
they are the, the tandem that really spearheads our NC State Queen and Disease Clinic. So they're going to give an overview of this extension offering that we have of sending in samples of queens and bees and getting them tested and uh, the data being sent back to you as the beekeeper um, as a fee-based service. So they're going to go over all of that. And then uh, to follow up, we're going to ha uh, have an interview of one of the larger queen producers on the East Coast, uh, Patrick Wilbanks of Wilbanks Apiaries in Georgia. Um, and he's going to talk about commercial queen rearing and, and everything that goes into it. So I'm sure it'll be a, a really excellent discussion. Um, make sure you join us in two weeks. Thanks again, everybody, for attending, and we will hopefully see you then.